Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith. Turn with me in your Bibles today to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. The book of Ephesians, the second chapter. And we will read verses 4 through 10. This passage of Scripture is familiar to us here at the Voice of Faith. But there's always new and exciting things in those areas that we're familiar with. I want to talk today about a subject we haven't really dealt with as a subject. It's been kind of sprinkled throughout our messages. But I want to deal with the subject of the grace of God, specifically God's grace and what it is, what it does for us, and how much of a blessing it is. Ephesians chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse number 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, three times we've found the word grace. Not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Grace is the beginning of our faith. Without the grace of God, you wouldn't have any faith. Faith wouldn't be in existence for you and I apart from his grace. So grace is the beginning of our faith. The end result of our faith is peace. Grace is always first and then peace follows. If you're looking for the peace of God in your life, you need to get connected with his grace first. Grace first, peace second. Praise God. <clears throat> grace is the origin of everything in the Christian life. And if you go back through your life, you can track it and you can tell that it wasn't because it was your performance and it wasn't that you were so hunky-dory, but it was the grace of God. It was His love. It was His mercy. The grace of God is the origin of everything in the Christian life. God has so much grace. If you look at verse 7, God has so much grace that it will take the ages, plural, the ages to come, to show us the exceeding riches of His grace. God is so rich in grace that it's going to take millions and millions of years for Him to reveal it to us. Wow, we are in for a treat for the next several millions of years as God reveals to us the exceeding riches of His grace. We have um, <clears throat> received so little of the grace that He has for us. And I believe that God desires for that to change and for our capacity to open up wide to receive more of His grace. I want to say that again. God has so much grace that it will take the ages to come to show us the exceeding riches of His grace. That's something for you to spend a day just thinking about that one truth right there will put a smile on your face, put a spring in your step, that God is exceeding rich in His grace toward us. Now, look at verse number 10. So many times I've read this and I've heard other people minister on this verse and they've separated verse 10 from what went before it. And that's, a, that's not a good thing to do. The, the real richness of this verse is found in the context. So read verse 10, but keep it with the verses that went before it. But for sake of time, look at verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. By putting that verse in its setting, we get a rich truth concerning God's grace. And that is this. Grace is God's willingness to do through you what He requires of you. What a statement. What a, what a definition for grace. Grace is God's willingness to do through you what He requires of you. And that God does require things of us. He requires for us to walk in love. He requires for us to be quick to forgive. He, he's, he requires of us to walk in faith, to walk in peace toward each other. There's so many standards that He has for us, but He's not requiring of us to do that on our own ability. 
One more time. Grace is God's willingness to do through you what He requires of you. You know, religion is anything but filled with grace. And I was raised in a church that had some religion in it. And um, when you get a hold of grace, you can see such a contrast between the grace of God and the religion of man. Religion is anything but filled with grace. Let me give you a, a definition of religion. Now, this is my definition. Religion is man's idea of what God requires. It's man-made rules and it's man-made tradition. That is religion. Grace and religion are so uh, opposed to one another. They're so opposite. Grace will make you sufficient in all things. But in religion, you will never measure up. And oh, how I struggled with that as a kid growing up in church and having the call of God on my life. I, I thought that you had to be perfect to be used of God. I wanted to be used, and yet at the same time, I wasn't perfect. So I was ping-ponging back and forth, really struggling with, I want God to use me, but I'm not perfect, and you have to be perfect to be used. And so it was quite a, a turmoil for me. But when you get the grace of God, you realize that by His grace, you do measure up. You are not a burden to God. That is a word that God gave me for somebody in this church today and for those that are listening. I want you to hear me loud and clear. You are not a burden to God. I don't care how much you've messed up. I don't care how much you've sinned this week uh, in, in the sense that you are not a burden to God. Don't go to Him thinking and feeling like, like, well, you know, here I am again, God. I need to repent again. God, I'm sorry again. God, I failed again. You are not a burden to God. God loves you. He's passionate about you. He's pursuing you. He has a covenant love with you. And His love for you is everlasting. It cannot be broken because of how much you mess up. So you are not a burden to God. Grace, here's another definition for you. Grace is God treating you like He wants, you, wants to and not as though, and not as, well, let me try this again. I messed up. Grace is God treating you like He wants to and not as you deserve. Since I messed it up, I'm going to say that two more times. <laughs> Grace is God treating you like He wants to and not as you deserve. This is another great aspect of the grace of God. Grace is God treating you like he wants to and not as you deserve. So here's the question. How does God want to treat you? He wants to treat you as though you had never sinned. He wants to treat you like Jesus. He wants to treat you like Adam before he fell. Now, my favorite of those is, is the second one. God wants to treat you like he treats Jesus. And we know how the Father treats Jesus. So he wants to treat you the same way, and that's called grace. So receive it. Don't go to him based on your performance. Don't go to him based on uh, how many Sunday school stars you have in the quarterly. Go to God knowing that he has grace in his eyes for you. He wants to treat you just like Jesus. So let him do so. Now, with this, uh, this aspect of grace that God is treating you like he wants to, with that in mind, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and I probably... Need to slow down some. I can tell I'm getting all fired up here. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10 gives us some further insight into the grace of God, what it is. So as you turn there, let me remind you what grace is so far. Grace is the origin of everything in the Christian life. Grace is God's willingness to do through you what He requires of you. And grace is God treating you like he wants to, and not as you deserve. All right, 1 Corinthians 15 and 10, and 10. The Bible says, but by the grace of God, now this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. He's talking about his life and his ministry. And he makes this statement. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So Paul's talking about how he, he did more than any of the other apostles. His ministry was bigger, it was larger in scope, there was more fruit in his ministry than the others. And he said, yet it really wasn't me who did that, it was the grace of God that, that accomplished those things. So we see here that grace is more than an attitude. 
It is an attitude from God to us, but it's more than an attitude. Grace is a power that works in us and through us. Grace is more than an attitude. It is a power that works in us and through us. And I think you can see that real clear here with the Apostle Paul. And you think about his ministry. You think about all the churches he established and all the places he went that no one else had went to, to preach the gospel. I mean, he got to people that had never heard about Jesus Christ. And he preached to them and he went into unknown places, and he said, yet it wasn't really me, it was the grace of God. So we see that God's grace is an attitude, but it is also a power that works in us and through us. Now, Romans chapter 5, please. Turn to Romans 5, 17. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing, wonderful grace. One of my favorite grace verses here, Romans 5, 17. Some of you probably have this marked in your Bible. You're familiar with this. Giving you a chance to get there. Romans 5, 17. The Bible says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace. Catch that. Those which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So if we're going to reign in this life, there's two elements. One is righteousness, which we receive when we're born again, and the other is this element of receiving the abundance of grace. Now this lets us know that grace is in measures. Some people can be, can be weakened in grace, they can have a little bit of grace, or they can be abounding in grace. So we can receive an abundance of grace. Those who receive the abundance of grace reign in life. Now I got a little phrase here I'd like for you to write down. I think is a good one. Good little nugget here. Goes like this. The grace that comes from his throne will put you on your throne. Oh, hallelujah. I like that. Glory to God. The grace that comes from his throne will put you on your throne. If you're going to reign in life, if you're going to be in charge and not be under the circumstances, but be in control, you need an abundance of His grace. And He's willing for you to receive an abundance of grace. You can never tap out on His grace. The grace that comes from His throne will put you on your throne. Man, I like that. Now, we are familiar in church, for those of us that have been around for a while, we're familiar with the phrase, the throne of His grace. So let's read that verse in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. We are familiar with this term, the throne of grace. So let's look at this, Hebrews 4 and 16. Praise the Lord. Scripture says to us, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. I believe if we understand that it's a throne of grace, we can come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So in this verse, talking obviously about prayer, when we go to God, there's some things we need. We need His grace. To help, we need to obtain some mercy. But I want you to look at this phrase, the throne of grace. So let your eyes feast on that for a moment. The throne of grace. The throne of grace. Question, what is a throne? A throne is a seat of authority. I'll give you a moment to write that down. Think about that with me. A throne is a seat of authority. And I know as I say that, you can readily picture that in your mind, but you may have not until this moment thought about that. But you know that that's exactly what it is. It is a seat of authority. Now, next question. Who sits on the throne? Well, the king. The king sits on the throne. The one with the authority. The one with the authority sits on the throne. Did a little bit of research, and it's kind of interesting. I don't know if you have done this kind of study or not and thought about this. 
But kings in olden times were called His grace. Isn't that interesting? His grace. And there He is sitting on a throne. He's, at, uh, he's sitting on a seat of authority. He's there and He's called His grace. <laughs> Man, I like this. Why? Why did they call the king His grace? Because He had the right to grant favor. Out of everybody in the court, out of everybody out on the street, the one man who could grant you favor, who had the right to grant you favor, was the king on the throne, his position of authority, and it was His grace. His grace because He had the right to grant you favor. What do we have here? We have, and man, I like this, this phrase, we have the authority of grace. We have the authority of grace. Let me say it a little bit different. Grace has authority. Grace isn't just some weak thing that, well, yeah, we just receive forgiveness from God. No, grace has authority. The throne of grace, the authority of grace. Grace is some strong stuff. Grace just isn't an ooey-gooey how God thinks and feels about us. Grace is powerful. Grace has authority. Grace, the grace of God, will enable you to reign in this life. Now, if anything's going to put you over and put you on top and cause you to be on top of your circumstances, it can't be weak. It can't be soft. It has to have some power. It has to have some authority to it. And that's exactly what the grace of God is and does for us. Praise God. Like that, the throne of His grace, we have the authority of grace. Now, with that in mind, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, this passage here is one of the most misunderstood in the body of Christ, has been for a while, because religion got a hold of it. 2 Corinthians 12, religion got a hold of it, of course, with the devil's help because he does not want us to truly understand this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Three verses that so many people just don't understand and get mixed up with, confused over. So verse 7, Paul speaking, and it says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance, <clears throat> excuse me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, plural, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now this phrase, exalted above measure, Let's look at it like this because this is what he's saying, that I should go to the next level. Once again, here's Paul talking about his ministry. He had gone to so many places before, yet not him but the grace of God, and yet he found because of the abundance of revelation, Satan sent him a messenger to buffet him so he would not go to the next level. That is so revealing of what the enemy does in our lives and wants to do is he wants to buffet us, he wants to beat us and keep us contained, to keep us confined. Hold your place here, we're going to come right back and look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 and 25. The Bible reveals to us here that Satan has a game plan for the end time saints. For those of us that are living here in the last of the last of the of the church age before the, the coming of the Lord, our enemy has a game plan to defeat us. And God in His goodness and His grace reveals to us in, in Daniel 7.25 what the devil's game plan is. Here's what the Bible says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That's the devil's game plan, is to wear you out, to wear me out, to wear all of us that are really 
sincere, loving God on fire for him. He wants to wear us out. The devil wants to wear you out with one trial after another trial after another, one temptation after another, one test after another. He wants to give what I call the pile-up effect, just one after another after another to where you just get worn out. You wear out and you think, dear Lord, how much more can a man take? How much more can a woman take? How much more can I stand? Just one more thing going wrong, and I think I'm going to throw down my shield, throw off my helmet, and just quit. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to wear you out, and he wants to beat you and confine you into a little space so you don't go to the next level. Hallelujah. Oh, i got to be quiet. The Lord's dealing with somebody. The Lord's ministering that to somebody. It's not time for you to wear out. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for ministering by your spirit. Okay, let's go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12. Let's look at this again. Now we can get more, now we have more of an understanding here just by that one verse of what happened to the Apostle Paul. This is what the devil wanted to do was to wear him out by buffeting him. Verse 12, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Let's look at some phrases here. The first one is thorn in the flesh. Thorn in the flesh. What in the world is the thorn in the flesh? I think you're going to like this definition. Thorn in the flesh. An irritation that causes a distraction that becomes a hindrance. <laughs> Boy, that speaks to me. And an, an irritation that causes a distraction that becomes a hindrance. We've got to be careful about being irritated. That's where things begin. We've got to back off from getting irritated with people. People are not your problem. Your parents aren't your problem. Your kids aren't your problem. Your neighbors aren't your problem. Church people aren't your problem. People at Walmart are not your problem. We cannot afford to get irritated with people. The problem is not people. The problem is the spirits that are motivating the people. So we've got to walk in love. We've got to walk in peace toward people. We've got to walk in, in, in love toward them. We've got to be gracious toward them because the thorn in the flesh begins as an irritation. That irritation becomes a distraction. Have you ever had a thorn in your, in your, you're out working in the garden, you get a thorn in your hand or on your finger, you get a splinter working with some wood, and you, that irritation, you got to stop working because you got a thorn. And that thorn has now become a distraction, right? An irritation becomes a distraction, which becomes a hindrance. This is the thorn in the flesh in operation. Now, the next one, before I go on, I think it's always funny how, you know, we think we're strong and great, but man, you just stub your little toe. You just stub your little toe, and man, everything comes to a halt. We got to check and see what the pinky toe is saying because we are hurting. <laughs> Something so small in our body can send us so much pain. Irritation, that, because it, that becomes a distraction. All right, the next one is a messenger of Satan. Messenger of Satan. What is a messenger of Satan? Well, it is simply an evil spirit sent to speak to you and to speak to others about you. I know you're taking notes. Let me say that again and tell I'm getting excited. Messenger of Satan is an evil spirit sent to speak to you and to speak to others about you. And I can guarantee you it's nothing good, it's all negative. That evil spirit's going to whisper in your ears, disguised as your voice, about how you need to quit, you need to give up, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, God's not answering, God's not listening, it's not working, you might as well quit. That is a messenger of Satan. Now that evil spirit will go to other people and whisper in their ears negative things about you that will hurt you or hinder your progress, hinder what you're believing God for. So this was a messenger of Satan, not a messenger from God. It was a messenger from Satan. 
And notice the word, to buffet me. This evil spirit also brought about a buffeting. To buffet means to beat. It means to keep beat down. And here's the big one. This evil spirit is sent to confine you. To restrict you from going to the next level. Buffet means to beat, to keep you beat down. And this, this is the big one, to confine you. To restrict you from going to the next level. Every tr true born-again child of God loves the Lord. We want to go to the next level. We want to grow in God. We don't want our faith to stay where it's at. We want to grow in faith. We want to grow in the knowledge of God. We want to grow in more glory and more grace. We know God has more for us. So we want to grow and come to the next level. Well, the an evil spirit is sent to keep you confined, keep you constricted and restricted, and to keep you beat back, beat down, so you don't make it to the next level. Most of the body of Christ are a bunch of detainees. Sad to say, most of the body of Christ are a bunch of detainees. We've been detained from our ministry, from our health, our prosperity, our inheritance. We have been detained. Year after year after year, we have been detained by the enemy. He does not want you to go to the next level. He doesn't want you to progress. He wants you to regress. He wants you to go back. He wants you to live in a small, confined area where you have no voice, no influence in anybody's life, that's his will for you. And he brings a messenger to buffet you. 2 Corinthians 12, 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. There's no need in praying to God and asking him to remove this thorn in the flesh. Why? He has given you the authority to remove it. That's what he's saying to, to Paul. Paul, you don't need to come to me to remove this. Because the next verse says, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. No need in praying to God about it because there is grace. Listen carefully. There is grace for every devilish strategy that tries to keep you contained. There is grace for every devilish strategy that tries to keep you contained. People are taking notes. I want to say this again. Those of you that are listening to the message, listen, this is God speaking to you. There is grace for every devilish strategy that tries to keep you contained. That's good news, my brother and sister. That's good news right there. There is grace for every devilish strategy that tries to keep you contained. And you may want to underline the word every. God's grace is greater and stronger than the devil. And his attacks against you and his strategy... And his maneuvers against you. God's grace is sufficient. You don't need to ask God to remove it. You need to exercise the authority of grace. Getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's read verse 9 again. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what am I dealing with and how do I change it? I've asked myself that question more than once. What am I dealing with and how do I change it? Now I'm going to say something to you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want you to be offended. I'm trying to help you. I want you to listen to the Spirit of God if this applies to you. If you're dealing with a recurring, long-standing situation, it is a messenger of Satan. You have a thorn in the flesh. If you are dealing with a recurring, 
long-standing situation, it is a messenger of Satan. You have a thorn in the flesh. Now, if that's true of you, you need to be smiling and you need to be happy because you're getting the answer. You're no longer in a fog. You're no longer in a cloud. You're no longer wondering what's going on. I'm telling you, you have a thorn in the flesh and you change it with and by the grace of God. You change it with and by the grace of God. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul and that's what will happen to you. God's grace is sufficient to break this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan. It's strong enough. You've got what it takes. You've got what, it's what it takes to break this devilish stronghold, this strategy of the enemy. You've got what, it's, what it takes to break free. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, Brother Phil, I don't know how to do that. Well, we're going to show you how here in just a moment. Read with me in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy 2. Verse number 1. 2 Timothy 2 and 1. Scripture says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Being strong in the grace of God, we don't ever have to be tripped up by the enemy. Not only does God have grace toward you, he imparts His grace inside of you, empowering you to do what you have been unable to do on your own. I want to say that again. He imparts His grace inside of you, empowering you to do what you've been unable to do on your own. Now let me say it to you in a real simplified way. Grace is the power to live the truth. Grace is the power to live the truth. God is not expecting you to live this life on your own ability. He's not expecting you to live this life on your own smarts. He's expecting you to live this life by His grace. Because only by His grace can you truly live this life to begin with. Grace is the power to live the truth. Now, let's look at exactly what we can do in taking this grace and using it against these devilish strategies, and break out of this confinement, this containment, and go to the next level. What can we do to make sure that we go forward? Well, Zechariah, please. Zechariah chapter 4. And I'll give you a minute to get there. That might be an area where the pages stick together, unless you've been through your Bible quite a bit. Zechariah chapter 4, it's a small prophetic book toward the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah 4, 6, and 7. The scripture says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power. But by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. We take dominion over our weakness with the grace of God. We take dominion over our weakness with the grace of God. How do I do that, Brother Phil? Speak grace. Speak grace, grace to those things that have confined you all of these years. This is how you're going to break out of this confinement. This is how you're going to break forth out of this containment, this being boxed in of the enemy. This is how you get rid of the thorn in the flesh is you're going to speak grace, grace to those long-standing situations. You're not going to just let it stay there and 
speak to you. No, you're going to speak back to it in the name of Jesus. And you're going to say, grace, grace. Brothers and sisters, let's just stop and think here for a moment. Now, as long as we've had some of these problems, and we've tried over and over again to overcome on our own ability, it's time for us to wake up and realize we can't do this on our own. It's not by our might. It's not by our power. But it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of grace. So we speak grace, grace to the mountain. We speak grace, grace to those problem areas, those, those infirmities, those weaknesses. We speak the grace of God. Grace is to be used the same way you use your faith. Now that might be a new thought for you as well. Grace is to be used the same way you use your faith. On purpose. On purpose. We've been, we're good here at this church about using our faith on purpose for a certain situation. We need to renew our mind and get just as good at using the grace of God on purpose and speak grace to those areas. We have, you have the authority of grace. God has given you His grace. It's time for you to rise up and do something with that grace. Release that grace. Put it to work for you by speaking grace to those areas. Now I believe our last verse is found in Acts 20. Acts 20, Acts 20 32. It's also one of my favorite verses concerning the grace of God. Acts 20 32. Let me give you a, <clears throat> something that happened in my life as an example before we get into this. A little over a year ago, it was a year ago in August, I got up in the morning, went to the kitchen, and all of a sudden, and I didn't know this was going to happen, but I could feel all desire for coffee and soda to leave me. Completely, all desire was gone. And just a few seconds later, I heard the Lord speak to me, as was the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit said to me, do not frustrate the grace of God. Do not frustrate the grace of God. What was he saying to me? He was saying, by grace, I've set you free from all desire of coffee and soda. Nothing wrong. I don't think that's a sin. If that's okay for you, that's great. This is just God's will for me. He doesn't want me drinking coffee and soda. So this is just for me. It's a personal deal. But by his grace, he instantly set me free from all desire of that. It's been over a year. I'm still completely free. have no desire for it. He said to me, do not frustrate the grace of God. So he's saying two things. One, this event was by the grace of God. And number two, you can frustrate it by going back and drinking soda and coffee. So I protect the grace by not going back to it. Since I'm free, why go back? Why go back and tempt the Spirit of the Lord and say, well, now that I'm free, I'm just going to go ahead and drink some more. No, no, I'm going to protect the grace. I'm not going to frustrate the grace. Because grace teaches you how to live. Grace teaches you how to live. Grace empowers you to live the truth. All right, Acts 20 and 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. First part of the verse. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. Instead of being worn out, instead of being beat down, we can be built up and we can receive our inheritance. How? By the word of His grace. The grace of God will build you up. Satan will wear you out and beat you down, but the grace of God will build you up and the grace of God will enable you to receive your inheritance. God's grace enables you to receive what, those things that belong to you. What a great verse. But we need a greater understanding and a mind renewal to the word of His grace. Do you ever get down this week? Something happens to you and you feel down? Get into the word of His grace. Build yourself up. And it's the grace of God that will enable you to receive your inheritance. We have received grace, 
that we might receive more grace. This is awesome about the grace of God. All of the times that God's had grace on you is so that you might have more grace. And so that you might have more grace and more grace and more grace. We are to go in this life from grace to grace. Let me say it to you like this. Grace leads to grace. And you want to write that down. Grace leads to grace. The grace you have is going to lead you to more grace. I want you to understand. I want you to get something here with this. God wants you to have an abundance of his grace. He wants you to have an abundance of his grace because he wants you to reign in this life. So you have grace that it might lead you to more grace. Grace leads to grace. And then the final little nugget here, grace abounds so we can abound. Grace abounds so you can abound. God has an abundance of grace. It's going to take millions and millions of years for God to show us the exceeding riches of His grace. His grace is abundant. It's abounding. It's abounding toward you so that you may abound. In fact, <laughs> let's go as a surprise verse. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Here's our bonus verse that we didn't get last time. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. The grace of God abounds that you might abound. And here's the verse that backs that up. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. The Bible says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Wow. <laughs> God is able to take all of His grace and make it abound toward you. What's the result of that? That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. That's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. God, the more grace that abounds toward you, the more you're going to abound. You're going to have all sufficiency in all things at all times that you may abound unto every good work. The grace of God is the origin of of everything in the Christian life. The grace of God abounds so that you may abound. Thank you, God, for your amazing, wonderful, and powerful grace. Thank you so much for listening today and being a part of the voice of faith. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe. <laughs>